Great. Hi, everybody. Uh, welcome to our webinar today. Thanks for taking some time on your Friday to join us today. Um, we recognize that this is a very unique time in the world for us right now. So again, I just want to thank you for taking a little bit of your time uh, to join us today. Uh, and for answering the polling question that we shared, again, it just kind of gives us an idea of who all is in the room today. Uh, my name is Jay Harris. I'm a philanthropy director at the Swedish Foundation. Uh, the foundation is the fundraising arm of Swedish, uh, the largest nonprofit healthcare system in Washington State based in Seattle. Um, before we get started, I want to take the opportunity to thank our donors who are joining us today. I think, you know, without your support, there's no way we could continue the innovative care uh, and work that we do every day around our patients. Um, in regards to how the webinar is going to flow for the next hour, um, uh, we will be asking questions to both panelists um, with a moderator uh, leading the discussion, but the event is meant to be informative and interactive, so please let us know your questions. At the bottom of the screen, uh, there's a Q&A window, so please input all your questions there. If you would like your name to not be associated with a question, just click send anonymously and we'll try to get to it as, as fast as we can. So uh, without further ado, I would like to welcome the moderator of our discussion today, Dr. Patrick Ryan, who's the Swedish Medical Center Chief of Cardiac Surgery. Dr. Ryan, take it away. Hey, thanks, Jay, and, and welcome to everybody. I uh, appreciate you taking the time off. It's a beautiful sunny day out. so. We don't want to sit in front of the computer too long. We'll try to keep this um, informative and and in cogent. Um, <clears throat> I just you know wanted to give a little bit of background. You know, over the next decade or so, uh, last decade or so, uh, you know, Swedish Heart and Vascular Institute has undergone a dramatic evolution uh, into you know the leading uh, provider of cardiovascular care in not only the region but from a surgical standpoint throughout uh, the state of Washington and um, the entire Providence St. Joseph Health System, which we're a part of. Um, really proud of that, really proud of the team members. And uh, today, uh, we want to focus on one particular aspect that, that has been really accelerating in its development, and it's, it's around collaborative care uh, between uh, two of our distinct specialties within cardiovascular surgery. One is cardiac surgery, and the other one is peripheral vascular surgery. And we're lucky to have two excellent technicians, physicians, people, and collaborative uh, co-directors of our uh, Center for Aortic uh, Care here at Swedish. Um, and they're going to uh, be answering questions today. Uh, um, it's going to be Dr. Uh, Greg Hayes and Dr. Sam Youssef. Uh, first, I'd like to introduce Dr. Hayes. He is the medical director for vascular surgery and uh, co-medical director for our Aortic Institute. Um, Greg, can you tell us a little bit about yourself, kind of how, what your journey was like to Swedish, your kind of my why in terms of working here, and, um, and you know, where you feel that uh, things are headed um, from here on out? I know there's been a lot of developments in, in vascular surgery, particularly over the last year and a half, which you've been instrumental on, and I certainly welcome to hear your perspective. Thank you, Pat, and uh, thank you everyone for joining us today and taking some time out of your week. Um, we'll try to make this uh, uh, informative and hopefully as informal as we can in terms of answering your questions. So I've been at Swedish for approximately five years now. Um, I arrived here um, when they were recruiting more vascular surgeons uh, for the Division of Vascular Surgery. I'm originally from Canada, and as it turns out, my wife's from Idaho, so landing in Seattle turned out to be a great place for us to be. Um, one of the, uh, 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 the chief of thoracic surgery here, Dr. Eric Valier, actually, and I were trainees together, and that's uh, the connection that we had in me arriving here. Um, once I arrived, um, I began to work with Dr. Youssef, who is the co-director of our Aortic Institute, uh, and really expanding the treatment of patients uh, who have aortic disease. And uh, we've been able to collaborate with one another doing much more complex cases. Uh, and as a result of that, we've really come up with this concept to expand our care of patients with, uh, with aortic disease and want to share with that, uh, share our goals and our passions with you today. 
and uh, look forward to speaking with you more about it. Uh, just a little bit about my background. I trained in Canada, uh, Toronto specifically, um, spent most of my training there and then trained uh, in Baltimore uh, uh, for an extra year of training and then went to the University of Florida where I was working in the academic field uh, before uh, moving into uh, more of a uh, practice like Swedish where we continue to do a lot of teaching uh, but uh, don't have necessarily full-time academic uh, commitments. So I'm glad to be here and look forward to speaking to you more. Thanks very much, Greg. Uh, next, I'd like to uh, introduce Dr. Sam Youssef. Sam is the um, director of our mechanical circulatory uh, support uh, program here at Swedish and also co-director of the Aortic Institute. Uh, Sam is uh, a locally trained uh, guy and he's been here quite a while in various capacities and, and really is a fantastic member of our uh, a team um, going forward. So here's Sam. Thank you, Pat. Uh, good afternoon uh, to our uh, guests and members, and thank you for the privilege of and the opportunity to share with you what we do. Uh, this is what we do every day, and uh, it's always a humbling reality to uh, take care of our patients and their families and to share with you a glimpse into what we uh, we take pride in for all of our years of, of hard work, of training and collaboration. Uh, I have the privilege of being under uh, Dr. Ryan's care uh, as he's the chief of our department and, uh, and I have the great honor of being a, in collaboration with Greg Hayes uh, for uh, the Aortic Institute. Um, yeah, I did train here. I was born and raised in California, but uh, left after uh, some time at UCLA and went to see the world and had an opportunity to train in England and and Belgium, and then uh, come back to Swedish for general surgery training. And then uh, after Swedish as general surgery training, I uh, found mentorship and uh, leaders in uh, New Haven at Yale New Haven Hospital. That's where a lot of the birth of the aortic um, work came in. And also with uh, Professor Magdi Yacoub in, in Egypt, uh, who's one of my mentors when he was in London. And also bringing that together uh, with interest for valve sparing, valve root procedures, and uh, aortic work. So we get the opportunity to go out and sample a lot of what the world has to offer and then bring it back home locally to be able to serve our community here. And so look forward to sharing with you some more details. Thank you, Sam. Um, uh, thanks for both, both of you for joining us today. Uh, I'd like to start with a polling question though. Um, uh, and the, uh, the question and the answers uh, are, what are the most common symptoms of aortic disease? And we'll wait in just a minute and Shiloh will uh, share the results. So uh, I'm gonna throw this out for to Sam and Greg to take over and, and uh, it looks like we have uh, a variety of answers here, and I'm hoping that the answers that uh, Greg and Sam can can uh, elaborate on will help kind of solidify this in your mind. So I'm uh, I'll let Greg and uh, and Sam tag team this one, and we'll uh, we'll go from there. So just to start off with um, kind of just briefly describe what aortic disease is and what the presentation is and if you've got a, a story that you'd like to share about you know somebody that you've met recently or whatever then this would be a good time to start that go ahead sam and sure greg um as you know the aorta is a pipe and it's a pipe that leads from the source of blood flow which is coming from the heart and there are branches of this pipe 
that deliver blood flow to every single organ in the body. And so if this, you know, like a water main, if this main pipe is affected by a disease that makes the wall of the aorta weaken, then any rupture, any disease, or any what we call dissection of this main pipe can affect any of the organs uh, that go through the body. So we identify aortic disease either as uh, impending, meaning there's an aneurysm or there is an ulcer or there's something that exists that is a potential threat or something that's active. So an active dissection, an active rupture, and all those will present very differently. And so when we say that someone is asymptomatic, it means potentially they have something that's silent in the heart and silent in the aneurysm that can be in the ascending, it can be in the arch, it can be in the descending. If it becomes active, that's when pain is the symptom. And pain can be starting from the chest at the base at the root. So where the coronary arteries go to the heart, if those vessels are affected, that presents as chest pain. If it affects the ascending aorta, you have the pain that starts in the chest and radiates to the back. If it affects the arch up here, then it can affect the blood flow to the brain, and that's where we get stroke. If it affects the spine, it affects the mobility, it's in the descending component of the aorta. And so all, if we think of it just as an arch, where the blood flows, any of those branches from this main pipe can be affected by aortic disease. And so our goal is to be able to identify patients who are at risk before it becomes a rupture, before it becomes a, a catastrophe that we have to deal with. And then even if it's a catastrophe that we deal with it in the swiftest and most comprehensive way that we can treat the patient. Time is of essence if it does rupture. And as we discuss, you know, transfer to our facility, uh, collaboration between the team, expedition of the operating room, and then expertise that goes into the reconstruction of the aorta, that's how it does. So yes, symptoms can be asymptomatic, but it can present with anything. So the answer to the question is all the above. And that's how aortic disease presents. Greg, you wanna share some? Yeah, I think the, uh, the important thing that both the Cardiovascular Society and the Vascular Surgery Society have recognized is that, that aortic disease is really a silent killer until it's no longer silent. Uh, so many of these patients do not have any symptoms uh, and may have a timing tick, uh, 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 time bomb ticking uh, in their chest or in their abdomen as the aorta develops whatever disease process leads to uh, their ultimate presentation. So much of what we want to do is be able to educate not only other physicians, but be able to educate the public about the presence of aortic disease and uh, how, to, how it's diagnosed and what risk factors may exist for it so that we can uh, then treat these patients before they present necessarily as an emergency. Because if we can treat them prior to presenting with an acute emergent problem, their survival rate and their recovery is certainly much, uh, a, a, it's a gr much greater advantage to be able to treat them electively than it is to treat them emergently. So uh, part of our goal here is to, as we develop the Aortic Institute, is to not only educate uh, the physicians, but also educate the public and lay people regarding aortic disease and its risk factors and how it can be diagnosed and treated before it becomes an emergency. So uh, Greg, what are, what are the different diagnoses? What, what are the different things that can go wrong with the aorta? Well, uh, I, you know, I, I, uh, I classify aortic problems as those that are genetically predisposing in patients and those that are acquired. Uh, so the, um, the most common are, at, at this point are patients who, are who have acquired aortic disease. And what that means is that they've had certain risk factors. Uh, well, risk factors can include such things as uh, aging population. So as we age, our aorta tends to degenerate or weaken. Uh, patients who have a high, who have a risk of uh, tobacco use in the past or have chronic hypertension. And then the, what happens to the aorta as it weakens, uh, it can actually form an aneurysm, which is an enlargement or a, a, a ballooning of the aorta itself. Uh, they can form tears within the aorta, 
Uh, and the aorta is, is um, I, I described to my patients, it's like the, it's like an onion. It's got multiple layers to it. And when they develop a tear within that aorta, it actually tears through the layers of the onion, so to speak. And that weakens the aorta and can cause uh, strokes, uh, can cause um, bleeding, uh, can cause spinal cord injury, uh, can result in uh, myocardial infarction or heart attacks. Um, valvular damage to the heart, all those. Uh, the other things are degenerative problems with the aorta associated with what we call atherosclerosis, which is the number one killer in our society today, which is the formation of plaque in our arteries. And as that plaque forms, those that plaque can then erode through the wall of the artery and cause what we call a, 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 an ulcer, an actual erosion in the artery itself that can rupture that can lead to that dissection or tear within the artery, or it can cause a hematoma within the wall that may weaken the wall itself. Dr. Yusuf, um, it, does it, is it more likely to happen in one part of the aorta or the other? Uh, what are the specific spots that, that you know, we focus on? It's, it's pretty amazing. That question answered 10 years ago would be different than the question that we can answer today. There are many genetic pathways that give rise to different regions of the aorta. It's, it's embryologic. So from the first two weeks of the way that cells are developing, they migrate from different components of the, the initial cell structure of uh, a two-week uh, zygote. As those cells migrate, they form basically the arch. And if there's an abnormality in certain cells, it will affect different components of the arch, different components of the aorta. So, for example, the root of the aorta uh, is different uh, genetic composition than the ascending component. And that is different and distinct from the arch. Some are global universal tissue things, so it affects all the tissues in the body. And those are the syndromic phenomena that we see, such as a Marfan syndrome or a Louis Dietz syndrome or any, or Ehlers-Danlos, those are syndromic, they affect a certain gene, but it can be more expansive and more extensive. Some are congenital, such as a bicuspid valve, which usually affects the valve itself and the ascending aorta component itself. Our, our goal is to understand more of these genetic pathways to be able to say, if you have this genetic picture, you're more likely to be involved in this certain area of the aorta. It's still too early for us to do that as a genetic screening or a genetic prescription in the way that we can, for example, in say breast cancer, for example, we can say if you have a BRCA2 gene, this is, a, this is exactly what the natural history would be. We're still learning this as compared to aortic disease. So oftentimes we hear a murmur of a bicuspid valve, for example, that then triggers an evaluation and then the evaluation then triggers a size criteria, and usually it's based on size criteria. But if there is suspicion or there's a family history and we have the privilege of a genetic profile of the patient or their family, we can say, this patient is higher risk, therefore intervention should be done at a, a lower size or a smaller size. And uh, often it becomes an index case of a family. A member of a family has an emergency event that emergency event is treated and thankfully, thank God, they, they survive. When they survive, we then do a regroup and we say, okay, now you have children or you have sisters or you have a mother or father. What is their history? And then we start to do a genetic profile or genetic understanding of the patient, the pedigree and their family. And then we can say, you are at risk or family members are at risk if they have a certain size or certain criteria. So long story short, if the location of the disease is in the root or the ascending aorta, we look at syndromic uh, varieties, but it can also be anywhere. It can be in the arch, the descending, or the abdominal aneurysm as well. Oftentimes, the first clue is a murmur in the heart if it's related to a bicuspid. Uh, many oftentimes, it's completely incidentally found. And our role is to find out which patients are at risk which size is at risk and what we need to do to help the patient not get into an emergency situation. 
Thank you, Dr. Yusuf. D Dr. Hayes, why don't we tackle the asymptomatic patients first? I mean, kind of what is your experience, your professional experience in terms of how the patients uh, present and, and what do you do about it? I mean, uh, what, it, what it types of intervention are available for patients who uh, have this discovered incidentally? Well, the, the, often the patients who have this discovered incidentally have had a study done for another reason. Uh, maybe they have uh, had a history of cancer, uh, malignancy, and they've undergone a CT scan. Uh, many, many of the patients have CT scans today for, for instance, uh, a prostate cancer or history of lung cancer or working up uh, some malignancy. We find a lot of these by uh, incidental um, events that are found by uh, various other x-rays looking for other things. Um, the uh, occasionally patients will present because they've had a family history and they've become alerted to it. Uh, they, uh, they may have had a sibling uh, who was relatively young who presented with some acute aortic event uh, and has been, um, and have been counseled uh, by their caregiving uh, physicians that their family members should be screened. We can find them for those reasons. Um, the, the, the treatment of the disease, uh, of aortic disease in general, has really undergone a great deal of uh, technological advance in the last uh, 20 years. Um, the description that I often use with my patients is if they remember dial-up internet uh, when the original AOL came and you had to use your telephone to dial into the internet compared to what we do today. And the, and the treatment of aortic disease has undergone the same real uh, technological and uh, intellectual advances that have exist in our society. So we have many, many uh, combined. We have, we have open operative procedures where we can um, actually go in and replace the aorta. Uh, we have combined procedures or so-called hybrid procedures where we do an open procedure and a what we call minimally invasive procedure, where we will combine an uh, open complex replacement of the aorta with placement of a stent in another portion of the aorta. And then we have other procedures that we uh, would describe as being totally minimally invasive. And this is where the real technology has taken off, where we can place stents in the artery through the artery itself, be it through the groin arteries or directly into the aorta and replace or, or, or really kind of uh, reinforce that portion of the aorta with a stent that allows us to not have to necessarily expose the patient to a large operative procedure. And, you know, that's one area where uh, we have been able to collaborate together with cardiac and vascular surgery is combining those open and, and, uh, and minimally invasive procedures into a hybrid procedure. It allows the patients to recover much more quickly, much lower incidence of complications, uh, you know, less insult on the body, now those are, you know, those are things that have really advanced and we, we really see, we're, we're, I think we're really at the tip of the iceberg now in terms of our technology and what we may be able to do in the near future in caring for these patients. Thank you, Dr. Hayes. Dr. Yusuf, can you comment on uh, the patients that present with an acute aortic syndrome? I mean, what, it, what it, do you see most commonly and, and kind of what are the specific treatment options that are afforded here at Swedish. Thank you, Pat. Um, we pray we don't have to see these, but we have to be ready when we do. And if we had our druthers about us, we would see every patient who has any of the aneurysmal disease that Dr. Hayes just described before they get into a catastrophe. But catastrophes happen, and we consider it a catastrophe because it is a life-threatening situation. And I have a couple cartoons. And Shiloh, if you can show us the first cartoon of aortic rupture and aortic dissection, this will be a slide that we can look at. And it will at least show us, this is what happens when a pipe bursts. I mean, we could say this is a, the picture on the left. That could be any of the houses in Texas this last week where the pipes froze and burst. I mean, it's the same concept. You have a very intricate network of, of tubing in the body, just like you would have a network of plumbing in your house. If any of them burst behind the drywall, you may have a symptom, you may not. But the symptom that's obvious is if it leaks. And so if there's a free rupture of this type of tissue, then you have a burst. And the picture that's on the left of the screen shows that if you have a burst, 
that is a life-threatening and catastrophic event. Sometimes there can be a, a burst, but it gets contained. And if that contains, then the patient's at least alive to come to us to see what the rupture looks like. And that's the picture on the right. Whereas the layers of the aorta separate the pathway of true blood flow and a pathway of false blood flow are shown. And our challenge then in the ascending aorta, if you can go to the next slide, please. Shiloh, if you can go, yeah, thank you. This is a picture of what happens in the ascending aorta and the arch. And just a review of anatomy at the base of the picture on the left there with the, that was the aortic root with the coronary arteries down at the base on the bottom left uh, are showing the coronary arteries protruding from the first branches of the aorta. As the ascending aorta rises, that gives rise then to a potential rupture there that can happen in the ascending aorta. That false lumen, that false channel that's filling up with clotted blood starts to pressurize. And as it pressurizes, it compresses on the true pathway. So now you have blood flow that's wanting to go in a certain direction, but it's limited because as the blood pressure tries starts to rise, that false channel compresses even further. And if that extends to the coronary arteries down below, it can result in a massive heart attack. If it extends into any of the the head vessels above, it results in a stroke. God forbid this to anybody who's listening or anybody that's there, but these are the things that we see, altered mental status or severe chest pain. As this dissection extends into the aortic arch, you can see there can be an extension into the arch, and then it goes into the descending aorta as we had seen in the other pictures. Now the challenge in these situations is to be able to diagnose this quickly, and the emergency room physician must be prudent to identify patients who are at risk, take a good family history, a quick family history, but not stalling and saying chest pain is just heartburn or chest pain, you're too young to have this, but to recognize the young patient who's presenting with, you know, possibly we call it the three strike syndrome, three strike hypothesis. One, a genetic predisposition of tissue abnormality. Two, an existing aneurysm, so a dilation of tissue already. And then three, a strenuous event or, a, or something. It can be activities such as even a golf swing it can be a weightlifter in the gym doing a you know, Russian deadlift. It can be during any physical activity or high emotional stress that can cause the high degree of blood pressure that causes the rupture in the tissue. This is what the ruptures look like. And then as we'll discuss later, we'll discuss a little bit more about how to repair this. But the acute syndrome is to identify the process, get the CT scan imaging that would diagnose the syndrome treat the patient initially with low blood pressure, lower the blood pressure, make sure that whatever is causing an impact into uh, the aortic or the aortic tissue is brought down to a minimum, and then transfer swiftly to a center that can manage this because it requires an emergency surgery. And the emergency surgery is done to restore blood flow down the true pathway and restore blood continuity to the arch or to the root or to whatever it is that we need to do. Thanks, Dr. Yusuf. Uh, Dr. Hayes, your perspective on kind of when do you see patients? I mean, we, we talked about a lot of different symptom, symptoms. Some of it can be weakness or numbness of a leg, uh, cold leg. Uh, how does that happen? Well, uh, um, a couple of points uh, that I'd like to uh, stress that Sam just discussed. Um, about 70% of these patients who present with acute aortic syndromes will present to an institution that cannot manage them directly. Uh, so they are then dependent on institutions like Swedish uh, to uh, receive them and transfer and then give them immediate treatment when, when they present acutely. Um, we see them uh, because the, uh, the disturbance in blood flow in the aorta itself can also affect uh, blood flow to the vital organs. Uh, we can see patients who, as uh, Dr. Youssef was discussing, have that tear that extends down into the descending thoracic aorta and into the abdominal aorta. And in these instances, we can actually see spinal cord injury uh, due to lack of blood flow to the spinal cord itself. Uh, we can see dysfunction of the, we can see renal dysfunction or kidney dysfunction, renal failure, uh, patients who have poor blood flow to the liver, 
uh, and intestines with what we call mesenteric ischemia, uh, which are life-threatening problems. And then they can uh, also affect blood flow to their lower extremities where this tear can go into one of the blood vessels supplying the lower extremities. And the patients may indeed present with uh, with lower extremity weakness, uh, lower extremity um, pain, um, and, or cold extremities. Um, we've had many instances where patients will initially present not with complaints of chest pain or back pain, but actually their initial presenting complaint may be pain or coldness or weakness in the limb because that's where the blood flow has been most significantly affected. Thank you. Um, can you describe you know, the, a situation where it takes, takes the team to make a decision and the team to actually affect a complete repair? What what is specifically your roles and kind of what parts do you tackle? How do you work together to to create the best outcomes? Greg, go ahead. Well, we we uh, we had a case that uh, was actually transferred in from uh, Prov Everett because they uh, uh, we worked in in conjunction with them and they actually had two cases uh, that had presented at the same time and and. Uh, reached out to us uh, because they were already taking care of one acute aortic uh, syndrome. So they reached out uh, to us. That patient was uh, had a number of challenges. Uh, he was actually uh, legally blind and also deaf. Um, and he had a uh, very, he had an ascending aortic dissection, which is uh, the tear that arises in the, the aorta just uh, as it comes out of the heart. Um, he had likely had symptoms for about 48 hours, uh, and he was in uh, Everett at the time and was going to be transferred down um, at their request for us to give him a hand because they were tied up. Um, so, uh, Sam, maybe you could describe how the team's uh, concept worked there. I think one of the blessings of... Uh of the COVID situation is we learned how to use interactive technology and expedited our ability to, to communicate. And communication became the cornerstone of any facile treatment. And so when we knew that this patient was in a kind of a 48 hour presentation, usually 48 hours is late. And if they've survived, they survived. If they haven't, they haven't. And, you know, we always encourage us to uh, make a maneuver within the first two to three hours of the diagnosis of a dissection. So when someone's presenting late, it's a very complex situation. But we were able to review his clinical presentation together. And one of my colleagues, uh, Dr. Hernandez, who uh, was on call that night, uh, was able to see the patient after we had all discussed it. And making the clinical call to say this patient needs to go to surgery now. And he presented with a cold leg. And what we do at that time is there's a, you know, a person who would start a, a meeting just like this. We'd all get a ping on our cell phone and say, emergency to evaluate patient X, meet on Teams meeting in 10 minutes. And so if we're at home having dinner with our kids or wherever it is, we get on our phones, we get sit down, we, we all chit chat. We are able to have the interactive technology of having the CT scan presented to us, a little clinical vignette from the physician himself or herself, wherever they are. Uh, to get on the same crew in the same meeting. And we can all look at it and take a clinical evaluation and say, this is the type of repair that the patient would need. This is the timing of intervention. We have space in our operating room. Let's go now. Or we say, we don't have space in our operating room right now. There's another emergency being done. Find the next facility that can do it. Timeliness of intervention is paramount. So we use the technology to help us communicate use the technology to help us facilitate the surgery. And we'll talk a little bit more about that shortly, but that's where this is important. You know, this is how we bring things into the future is to, some of it is arts and crafts. So some of it is purely surgical technical, but a lot of when we talk about the future of medicine, the future of engagement, the future of, of, of aortic treatment is communication. And that's what we are striving to do more and more. So there's a huge partnership between cardiothoracic and vascular surgery, a huge partnership with the inter, 
the, the facilities that need to be and the, the integrity of the intensive care unit, the presence of cardiac anesthesia to help facilitate uh, you know, recovery of such a patient in the ICU, availability to have nephrology teams, our, our ICU nurses and their training that they bring to the bedside and, and the great respect that we have for our colleagues at all levels, from the respiratory therapist to the person who cleans the room. Uh, to prevent wound infection. I mean, this all becomes, yes, the, the gold standard that we have now, but the foundation upon which when we say the future of surgery presents is, is having excellent communication, respect amongst colleagues, and always a striving for best in class. No, no reason why we can't do whatever we aspire to do. And, and that's where we facilitate together as a team uh, to, to bring the best in technology. And then when we get to the operating room to bring the best uh, that we can offer that patient at that time, every time. Yeah, thanks. Um, I think we'll we'll back up a little bit. You mentioned sort of the population health, I think, and we wanted to talk about advancements, but I think a big part of this advancement is the connectivity, regional connectivity, how we bring as many team members and as much experience to the bedside as quickly as possible. So, yeah, I think that is one of the, you know, the the, things that we've learned out of this pandemic has really accelerated that process. Um, Dr. Hayes, can you talk about, you know, screening? So we talked about incidental findings, we, uh, but, you know, how do we find out about this stuff uh, by looking for it, both imaging-wise, deliberate imaging, and uh, maybe genetic testing? And then it, both of you could probably comment on that because uh, there are various approaches. Well, um, there are there are some screening uh, modalities approved now by uh, within the last four or five years. Medicare actually approved abdominal ultrasound, for instance, for screening for abdominal aortic aneurysms um, in high risk patients. Uh, prior to that, Medicare would not cover uh, costs for a screening ultrasound. But now, uh, screening ultrasounds in high-risk patients uh, are covered by most insurance companies and Medicare, since the insurance companies follow their, their lead, typically. Uh, so we would, uh, in that group of patients, we would look at patients who were, uh, we would deem to be at high risk. Uh, the patients that are at most high risk for abdominal aortic aneurysms, for instance, are um, patients of male gender, patients who have a long history of smoking, uh, or tobacco use, and uh, patients who have a significant family history. We know now that um, if there is a family history of a female in the uh, family with a degenerative atherosclerotic aneurysm, um, that the incidence within the family itself is significantly increased. So when I see patients who may have had a diagnosis made, I'll often ask them about um, if they have any siblings or do they have any um, children that may be, for instance, over the age of 50, which is where we would typically screen for those patients with uh, acquired atherosclerotic vascular disease. From the genetic component, um, I think we're still learning a lot about genetics. Uh, we know that there are certain syndromes that are associated with degenerative disease of the aorta aortic dissection and aneurysm formation, such as Marfan syndrome, which is an inherited trait um, uh, that is what we call autosomal dominant. So it's not related to sex, it's autosomal and it's uh, dominant. So if you inherit the trait, you have a 50% chance of inheriting it from one of your parents. Uh, there are other syndromes such as Ehlers-Danlos syndrome and uh, Louis Dietz syndrome, which which Dr. Youssef touched upon, and he may want to talk a little bit more about it, as they typically will affect the aorta as it arises from the heart. Um, we don't typically, uh, in most instances, do CT scans for screening. Uh, so they can patients can have an abdominal ultrasound, or the other thing that they can have is an echo, uh, which would look at their ascending aorta and the size of that. Um, but maybe uh, Sam could make a couple of more comments about the genetic components. Yeah, uh, Dr. Youssef, um, <clears throat> so did, if you could talk a little bit about screening, kind of who should be screened if you have a family history or uh, a heart murmur. And, and we did have a question from the audience about 
the trigger for uh, pursuing treatment for uh, bicuspid aortic uh, valve disease in terms of a trigger for uh, intervention. Perfect, thank you, Beth. So often the first screen is a visit of the primary care physician uh, office when they put the stethoscope to the heart. That will also elicit either a murmur that will then trigger an echocardiogram. And if the murmur is there, and it can be asymptomatic or asymptomatic, and often a murmur doesn't necessarily mean that there is either a tightening of the valve or a leaking of the valve, but it shows there's an abnormality in blood flow. But the ultrasound will also start to tell us about size. And so the first screening is done as a physical exam, honestly. And so that physical exam is important, the yearly physical, getting in touch with your primary care doc in the context of if a person has a family history, informing that physician that that's what is there. The, ec the, the physical exam then elicits an echocardiogram, and then we can see, is it a bicuspid valve or is it a trileaf valve? Is there tightening of the valve or is there regurgitation of the valve or is the valve normal? And then it will give us a first glimpse into the size of the aorta. Ultrasound is not very good at determining size. It tells you if it's big, but it doesn't tell you specifically how big. Because often, if you think about it, say you're making a salad and you have a cucumber, if you cut the cucumber exactly orthogonal, that is the accurate diameter of the cucumber. But if you cut that cucumber at an oblique angle, you say, oh, wow, I have a much larger cucumber than I have. So ultrasound is an orthogonal, it is an off-center plane. So when you want to look at the size of the ascending aorta, for example, that will trigger a CT scan. And the CT scan will give you the 90 degree picture of what's there. Bicuspid valve is unique because it is a congenital anomaly that affects most people and it's genetically linked with an ascending aortic aneurysm. The way that we understand bicuspid valve, if you have a valve that is abnormal, is that valve going to take us to surgery? If it meets the criteria for stenosis or regurgitation, and that valve will go with like the classification for all aortic valves with the certain criteria, then that's what's gonna take us to the operating room for intervention. We look at the ascending aorta and say, if that ascending aorta is above four and a half centimeters at the same time, then that ascending aorta is replaced. Say you have a bicuspid valve that does not have an abnormality. The bicuspid valve is completely normal. We then look and say, well, what is the size of the ascending aorta? We know that the normal criteria for most patients to go to, to a surgery for the ascending aorta is five and a half centimeters. There are certain high risk categories where that threshold is brought lower, where we say between 4.5 and 5.5, this is a gray zone. If there's a genetic syndrome like Marfan's disease or Louis D or, or, or Ehlers-Danlos, that threshold is at four and a half centimeters because we know that tissue is very fragile. Louis Dietz syndrome actually goes down to four, four centimeters in some patients. The bicuspid valve, this is the gray zone. And Alejandro, I'm seeing your, your question in the, um, in the forum. Yes, it is a gray zone. If someone is with four and a half centimeters that's been stable and there is no associated abnormality in the valve, it is safe to watch that. That does not necessarily mean it's a trigger. However, if there's a rapid rate of growth, and we say rapid rate of growth, meaning greater than half a centimeter within six months to a year, meaning that tissue is actively dilating, that is a trigger for surgery. So absolute size, 5.5 is the buzzword that everybody hears. Yes, that's correct. In certain high risk groups, meaning there's a family history of disease, family history of aortic dissection, family history of or genetically proven history of any of the syndromes that we have, that threshold moves down to four and a half. The timing is up to discussion between the patient and their physician, their access to medical care. I have a patient who is just a bicuspid valve, it's totally normal, 4.5 centimeters, but he lives in rural Africa and may not have access to a facility to be able to treat him at that time. And he's coming in for an elective surgery for treatment of it. So a lot of it is a discussion between your provider and you eventually, most of them will need to be done. What is the comfort? What is the safety? What are the comorbidities? You should be able to have a near perfect operation with a greater than 99.5% success rate in order to do something electively. This is the challenge of aortic surgery. 
many patients don't have symptoms. Many patients don't have uh, something that they're complaining of. And so how do you take an asymptomatic patient and put them through a pretty significant operation? It has to be done perfectly. And so that's where the responsibility is on us. The technical maneuver is yes on us, but in an elective situation, that's where we wanna make sure the screening is done right and the correct pathways for each patient are done right. So I hope that helps clarify some. That was a great answer, Sam. Um, I think you got some slides that sort of show us kind of what the technical aspects of uh, aortic repair hmm. look like and, and also describe how we can um, collaborate between the, the different specialties. This is, this is the joy of arts and crafts. So we get to give you some cartoons about what we do that at this time cannot be replicated by a machine or a device or a robot. This is a view of the aorta as we see it in surgery. And this is a view of what happens when the layers, the component layers of the aorta fall apart, the valve gets unhinged, the aorta becomes mush. And we have to put it together. Some of it we can replace, but some of it we can repair. And if there's a way that we can preserve the valve and keep your valve, that's a win-win but it has to be competent. I don't want to keep a valve if three months later, it's going to become insufficient and have to have a replacement. So the ability to rebuild the scaffold around the valve, as you can see in the slide located on A, B, and C, is by really building the wall of the valve. And then where the posts are, making sure that they get resuspended. This is what we call a reconstruction of the aortic root. The mid portion of the ascending aorta usually is replaced by a graft, as you can see in D, that's the type of graft that comes up. And in, in image C, you can see how we rebuild basically, looks like an Oreo cookie, but I mean, you have whatever is on the inside there, that is a felt layer. And that felt is then quilted so that each of the orifices of the head vessels that you can see in image C are patent with adequate blood flow going to the brain. We're not removing the tissue all the time. Often we're reconstructing and rebuilding. And that then serves as a scaffold so that when we do the final layer in D, we have a, a solid construction that has extended from the base of the heart with patent coronary arteries and a, a valve that's built with integrity and a scaffold that's rebuilt hopefully preserving the valve. If the valve cannot be preserved because it's totally sheared off, it has to be replaced. But then going to C, where we've re-implanted the head vessels, and as you can see now, the body is disconnected from blood flow. So we have to do a, a certain circuit of uh, suspended animation, as we describe it, to be able to preserve the blood flow to the brain, perfuse the brain while we are doing this, and cooling the body to a temperature between 24 or 18, depending on the extent of the dissection, this is degree centigrade, so that we preserve the metabolism and slow the metabolism of the brain and the body while we perform the surgical maneuvers required to rebuild and reconstruct the aorta. As we do this procedure, we look into further you know, interventions and collaboration with our colleagues in the vascular surgery department. And if you go to the next slide, Greg, I'll let you describe kind of what an endograft is, what it means for us for our collaboration and what it means in the context of a dissection. Go ahead. Oh, uh, typically these aortic dissections will result in a syndrome that we call malperfusion. And, and what malperfusion is, is really uh, more of the blood flow is going into the false lumen, in other words, the lumen that was created by the tear, uh, than is going into the true lumen. Um, and after uh, they've had their uh, surgical repair of the ascending aorta, or there are a group of patients who present with strictly tears in the descending aorta itself, independent of the ascending aorta, patients may develop this malperfusion syndrome where blood wants to go through this false lumen preferentially as opposed to going through the true lumen. And what we want to do uh, in the long run for these patients, many of whom are young, uh, maybe in their 40s, we, we see patients in their 30s even, 30s, 40s, 50s, 
we want to promote what we call aortic remodeling. And what aortic remodeling is, is, is really driving the blood flow back into the true lumen so that the false lumen wants to have uh, an, an opportunity to basically collapse and the aorta itself really, for lack of a better term, heals. We want to try to return the aorta back to the physiology that existed before the event occurred. Well, one of the ways that we can do that is to place uh, stents in the true lumen, which are covered. So many people think of stents as uh, you know, the original stents that we developed many years ago were uh, scaffolding, which would hold the artery open, which were used for coronary stents or for peripheral arterial disease for occlusive disease. For in other words, the vessel was narrowed and the stent was used to hold the vessel open. In this instance, the stent is covered typically by a Dacron or a PTFE type material, Gore-Tex. And so we use a covered stent and that scaffolding uh, or that stent is placed on a scaffolding of what we call nitinol, which is a, an, um, a nickel alloy type material that, that expands. So we place the stent within the true lumen and then drive that blood flow into the true lumen and cover areas of what we call fenestrations. Fenestrations are communications which exist between the true lumen and the false lumen and can, and can be numerous throughout the aorta itself. So we want to place a stent within the true lumen, drive blood flow into the true lumen, decline blood flow into the false lumen and promote aortic remodeling to allow patients uh, to uh, heal their aortas and live longer and normal lives. There have been a number of studies that have shown that if we promote aortic remodeling, uh, patients have a low, much lower incidence of aortic related death and what we call degeneration of the aorta because when the aorta tears, it weakens the aorta and then it will then become aneurysmal and enlarge. So this is an area where we work in conjunction with uh, uh, Dr. Youssef and Dr. Ryan and their colleagues where they may have already repaired the ascending aorta and the arch portions of the aorta. And then we work in conjunction with one another. The way that I often think of this is that cardiac surgeons deal with arteries and diseases that are contiguous with the heart. Vascular surgeons deal with arteries that are outside the heart. And this is an area where the two blend together. They're not necessarily contiguous with the heart. They're not necessarily outside the heart. So this is an area we would collaborate with one another so we can provide the best care we can for these patients. Yeah, that's great. This, this illustration shows placing a stent from uh, the open chest side, but more commonly it's placed up for the leg artery and with a similar result. Um, we did have a question from one of the audience members about uh, this malperfusion issue uh, in terms of what we mean by a cold limb. Is that cold to the touch or uh, is it just feel cold to the patient? What is, what, is, what is that? How do they present? Well, the patients themselves may describe the limb as being cold. Yes, they, they will say that their, their leg or their limb or even their arm, uh, they, they feel it's cold. Uh, but on examination, uh, the patients often will have absent pulses. Uh, we can't find a pulse or any blood flow in the limb and the limb itself will feel very objectively cold too on examination. So there's the subjective component that the patient will feel and also the objective component of actually examining the patient and the limb being cold. Great, thank you. Yeah, we're uh, running up against a little bit of a time. Uh, so, so why don't we sort of wind up with comments from either of you of kind of what, what your vision is for the Aortic Institute at Swedish. Greg, you wanna go first? Well, you know, I, um, I, I think there was, a, there was a great question at the beginning here with, uh, do you know anyone who has aortic disease? And as it turns out, my, my oldest daughter has aortic disease. My oldest daughter has what Dr. Youssef was describing. Uh, she has a bicuspid aortic valve. 
and she has uh, some dilatation or enlargement of her ascending aorta. So there's a certain personal component for me in this that uh, I actually have a family member that has aortic disease. But what, you know, I think that my, my passion with this is to really educate both, uh, as I stated earlier, both uh, the healthcare community in terms of caregivers and the public in terms of uh, the incidence of aortic disease, early diagnosis of aortic disease and improving survival and improving quality of life for those people that have it. That's where my real passion lies. Dr. Yusuf? It hits home when it's your family. And uh, I also have family that's been affected by uh, my own father. And so we have uh, the, the wish and the desire to treat our community as if they were our own family. And how we can best do that is to be present, to be available, to be always at the service and the timing that would be able to give life back to somebody. That's a tough call. And the collaboration that we have amongst each other, amongst our team members, amongst my partners in the cardiac surgery group, to be able to always be present, to be readily available to take care of patients who need us. My preference is to be able to have an elective situation that we can avoid the emergencies, but it's impossible to find every single person who has aortic disease uh, ahead of time. And so even when the emergencies come, we have to treat them and to be able to treat them well, take something that has a normally, you know, 40 to 50% mortality rate. That means 50, 50 chance of being alive if this happens and, and, and developing the, the path, the pathways, the thresholds and the ability to, to provide the patient with the best outcome and survival not just for one or two years, but for the rest of their life. It's a matter of plumbing. So it's a matter of us being able to put things together. Uh, there's a question regarding fragile tissue type patients, Ehlers-Danlos, for example. Dealing with that type of a patient in the context of a rupture is very tricky and requires significant reconstruction, a combination of endovascular and open procedure. So we try to reinforce things from the inside, but as well support from the outside. Uh, the thresholds are lower for those types of patients as well. So we try to get them sooner than later. And so the challenge for us is to be able to identify patients at risk, bring them to the, to, to the, to the team, make a collaborative decision-making process that involves the patient at the forefront and have a tailored treatment plan for them. And if we can do that successfully, then we have served every individual that comes to us. We've served the community as a whole and we fulfill our role in being, you know, servants to the community and caretakers of our fellow human. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to uh, introduce Libby Manti from the foundation. Lindy, Libby. Thanks, Dr. Ryan. Um, I just wanted to take a moment to thank you all um, for attending today. And it was quite a lot of information. So feel free to follow up with questions as we're closing out our time today and we will follow up with you um, to get those answered. And Dr. Yusuf, Hayes and Ryan, we greatly appreciate you making the time um, to do this and to educate our community. I think it is one of the best opportunities that we have, Jay Harris and I, in our role is to be able to connect the community to what's going on at Swedish and how we're continuing to bring the most advanced treatments to our community. Dr. Ryan, will you uh, talk a little bit about the role community support and philanthropy has in bringing some of these programs like the aortic disease program to Swedish Heart and Vascular? Sure. You know, I think in, in my experience with Swedish Heart and Vascular, I'm also one of the co-medical directors for the, the Institute, the Cardiovascular Institute, is that uh, the, you know, donors have funded a lot of our navigator positions. And so that really connects us with our patients, make sure that there's an extra layer of um, attention giving so that information doesn't get dropped, that, that patients have ready access to the programs, and that <clears throat> busy clinicians are supported in, uh, you know, 
they're out there making doing surgery and and you know trying to make these tough choices but it, there's like a whole background of work that goes on in terms of uh, uh administrative work that has to get done in order to have a program so uh i think that that's a huge impact for us and and i can't i that's i, I can't o overestimate how much how much that's appreciated Thank you. Um, and Dr. Yusuf or Hayes, do you have kind of any last comments? Otherwise, we want to thank everyone so much for joining us today. Thank well, you. I'd certainly like to thank everyone for their time. And, uh, you know, this is a passion that I think both uh, Dr. Yusuf and I have to really, um, you know, make uh, life much better for many of these people who have a life-threatening problem. And, you know, one of the things that that um, that we've touched upon is is when these become emergencies, they they are extremely life threatening. And actually, seventy five percent of the patients who rupture their aorta will never get to the hospital. And then of that seventy five percent, we we can save about fifty percent of them. So we we need to really educate people and and find these diseases before they become an emergency. Actually, I have to argue with you a little bit, Dr. Hayes, is that, that the outcomes for um, ascending aortic aneurysm, uh, a, a dissection repair here at Swedish, uh, are about 85% survival. But I, but I said rupture, doctor. Rupture. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so when the, when the aorta, I, I, I want to stress when the aorta ruptures, when it, right. when it actually has, uh, Dr. Youssef showed that one slide where the aorta was where blood was free flowing out of the aorta and when it when it's a rupture that they, that they, they have a very poor survival rate. Yeah. <laughs> Good Thank point, you. Dr. Ryan. <laughs> Thank you again. And I wanted to let the participants know um, there's going to be a really short survey at the end. We'd love to hear from you. We are still getting the hang of all these virtual events. Um, and so your feedback is really, really critical to us moving forward. So Thank you so much, and I hope you guys catch some of the sunshine out there today. Yeah, is is there Libby? Is there an opportunity if they have further questions to to either what what is the mechanism for them to reach out? Yeah, you are welcome um, to reach out to Jay Harris or I at our email or our phone, and we can connect you if you have additional questions to Drs. Hayes, Yusuf, and Ryan as well.